good day. This is Kevin Albright uh, here to bring you another seminar presentation topic, neuromuscular diseases. I gave you your uh, briefing last semester on neuromuscular blockers, so only seems fitting that I give you this briefing as well. It's real important for an anesthesia provider to understand what can happen when pathophysiology meets practice with a lot of these disease processes. So potent held anesthetics, neuromuscular blockers, sort of hypnotics, reversal agents, all have profound implications. And uh, some are similar and some are different in many of the disease processes we're going to talk about. You'll get a lot more out of this briefing if you have a firm understanding of the neuromuscular junction physiology. Uh, and if you need to review that, you can watch my original YouTube video at the link provided. Okay, here's the outline of what we're going to cover today. Morgan McHale has a whole chapter dedicated to neuromuscular diseases, while Barish just classifies these as rare and coexisting. So the flow is basically going to go through, like Morgan McHale, we're going to talk about myasthenia gravis, myasthenic syndrome, muscular dystrophy, myotonia, periodic paralysis, and the other perineoplastic syndromes. Myasthenic gravis. So it's an autoimmune disease where antibody formations are created to target proteins at the neuromuscular junction on the motor end plate. Uh, most patients will have titers for the nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Not every patient will, though. Uh, ultimately, it leads to a destruction of the postsynaptic membrane. So it doesn't matter how many neurotransmitters you send, it's, there's just no one there to receive the message. This disease is cyclic, meaning the patients will have exacerbations and remissions. Different things can exacerbate a patient, such as stress, surgery, heat, uh, various things, uh, emotional dis uh, distress. A lot of patients will have problems with their thymus. They'll have hyperplasia or hypoplasia, and one of the many common surgeries for patients that present with myasthenia gravis is thymectomy. Myasthenia gravis is characterized by a weakness that uh, becomes worse and worse over time and with repetition. So patients will be well rested in the morning and able to move, and as the day progresses, they'll become more and more symptomatic. Uh, they can have symptoms of dysarthria, dysphagia, which can lead to aspiration, uh, various uh, muscles in the, in the body which are characteristically classified in the classification system we're going to go over. Yeah, it can be quite debilitating. All right, myasthenia gravis continued. Any muscle can be affected, predominantly muscles innervated by cranial nerve. That's why you have the bulbar involvement, uh, involvement of the uh, larynx and the pharynx. It's treated with immunosuppressants, cholinesterase inhibitors, and corticosteroids. Pyrostigmine is the uh, mainline treatment. Its duration orally is two to four hours. One of the things that can happen with any type of uh, anti-cholinesterase uh, drug is a cholinergic crisis. So we all know BB sludgem. Uh, one of the interesting things with it, though, is that counterintuitively, they have muscle weakness. So when you have a patient, patient that presents, you think this would be obvious, but I guess in cases it, it necessarily isn't. If they have profound muscle weakness, you give them hydrophonium called the Tensilon test, and if they become more weak, then that confirms your suspicion of a cholinergic syndrome as opposed to poorly controlled myasthenia gravis. So, there's different stages of the disease. Uh, the Osterman staging system, and this can be found in uh, uh, Barish or Morgan McHale, both uh, talk about this, uh, but there's type 1, which is ocular involvement only. Um, there's type 2A, which is generalized by predominantly limb and axial muscle. Um, type 2B, uh, which can be mostly the oropharyngeal and respiratory muscles, um, or both. Uh, class 3, which is um, ac uh, acute fulminant presentation with respiratory dysfunction, and type 4, which is just severe generalized weakness. And then uh, it can also affect the uh, myocardium. It can cause uh, myocarditis, can lead to atrial fibrillation, um, and atrioventricular conduction delays. And you'll see that as a resonating to this presentation that a lot of these uh, muscular diseases 
um, can interfere with uh, the conduction system um, of the heart uh, and lead to uh, uh, heart failure. So, um, how do we deal with this with our anesthetics? Uh, myasthenias gravis, when poorly controlled, um, those patients are very, very, very sensitive to neuromuscular blockers. Um, some places in the book advocate um, use of potent inhaled anesthetics only, and that is enough to obtain muscle relaxation. However, going through the literature, it seems that there are certain operations where that may not fly. Um, thymectomy may be one of them, which is one of the surgeries uh, to correct this uh, autoimmune disease, uh, where you may need uh, uh, intrathoracic approach, which may need a double lumen tube and uh, single lung ventilation, uh, in which case you may need more than potent inhaled anesthetics uh, to optimize uh, the surgical field. So um, that may not always fly. Uh, these patients, if you look per the book and you're just reading in most books, it's going to say that uh, these patients are resistant to succinylcholine. And when you're comparing this to other diseases like myasthenic syndrome, that's how you should remember it. That they are resistant and they need more, more of a dose, 1.5 to 2 milligrams. Uh, however, um, different sources in the literature say that patients that are well controlled and patients that took their pyridostigmine that morning, um, may not be resistant to succinylcholine and actually have uh, oversensitivity to it um, and will have prolonged effects from it because um, pyrostigmine can affect pseudocholinesterase as well. So uh, be cautious of that. Um, you can use succinylcholine safely. Um, you don't need to worry about hyperkalemia um, in that respect, but you could have a prolonged effect. So just be aware of that. Um, epidurals are okay. Uh, Barish advocates amides over esters because I guess, like with the succinylcholine, uh, uh, metabolism can be impaired. All right, so myasthenic syndrome, or as the book describes it, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is an autoimmune disease that's associated with the paraneoplastic syndrome. And all that means is that it is a autoimmune disease that is associated with some kind of malignancy somewhere in the body. This one typically presents as small cell lung CA, but it doesn't have to be, it can be any type of neoplasm. Antibodies are created uh, against the presynaptic calcium channels that allow for an influx of calcium for release of uh, neurotransmitters. So these efferent motor, somatic motor neurons have a decreased ability to do that. So it's not so much per se the muscle, but it's the, the nerves innervating the muscle. These patients, unlike myasthenia gravis, will have autonomic dysfunction. So they'll act like diabetics. They'll have wide swings and blood pressure and heart rate. They won't react uh, as you would anticipate to position changes. Uh, they'll have a reduced ability to sweat. So you, know, you want to be real vigilant and cautious with any type of uh, bear huggers or forced warming. Uh, you want to uh, make sure that uh, you keep a close eye on their temperature. Treatment for this is 3,4-diaminopyrimidine, which uh, can cause uh, prolonged action potential, which allows more time during depolarization for quantum to be exocytosed for those uh, working calcium channels to allow for more calcium to enter to have that effect. All right, so myasthenic syndrome continued. Conversely, with myasthenic gravis, these patients are more sensitive to sucks and not to polarizers, so they're, can, they're sensitive to both. You always want to continue their pre-medication up to the time of surgery for their optimization of their current disease process. Any patient that has any type of malignancy if they're not responding as you would think on their train of four, 45 minutes after you gave them their, your rocky runium, they're not coming back with twitches. You know, maybe this should be in your differential. Maybe they've got something going on. Maybe they've got myasthenic syndrome. Just something to consider. With this disease process and with any of the disease process I'm talking to today about, you always want to consider your electrolytes, um, especially for myasthenic syndrome, calcium. Is their calcium low? Or is their ionized greater than 1.1 to 1.2? Potassium, if their potassium is low, you can have uh, 
muscle weakness. And then we just learned with our OB patients, hypermagnes hypermagnesemia can lead to muscle weakness as well. So just something to be aware of. All right, so when you talk about myasthenes gravis and myasthenic syndrome, I think it's better to talk about it on a scale uh, where you kind of line up the two to look at the differences. So uh, myasthenes gravis is more prominent among females in the 20s to 40s, while myasthenic syndrome is more prominent among males in an older generation from 50s to 70s. Myasthenic gravis is aggravated uh, or worse with repetition, while myasthenic syndrome is actually there's relief or patients will be stronger by repetition. All the muscles can be affected by myasthenic gravis. There's that classification system that we discussed. Cranial nerves, however, are predominant, while in myasthenic syndrome, proximal limbs appear to be the most affected. You can see here the response to succinylcholine and then to non-depolarizers. Barish states that both of them are poor response to anticholinesterases. I think they're talking about reversal because we both know that myasthenes gravis is responsive to anticholinesterases as a treatment. No book really addresses well reversal with either of these two syndromes, but we'll talk about this with our research article. All right, so speaking of reversal, uh, like I said, most sources don't discuss it. Um, I could not really find a good resource for the use of neostigmine and uh, reversal of muscle relaxation non-depolarizers if they are used. However, clearly there are surgeries where it is used. Uh, thymectomies where one lung ventilation is required and, and uh, surgical treatment for these patients uh, sometimes requires double lumen tube um, so you can optimize the field for the surgeon so that they can do single lung ventilation uh, to remove the thymus. Um, patients in Europe obviously are, are uh, Sugamidex is available. Uh, there's not a whole lot of research on it with uh, uh, my sneeze gravis patients. Um, it seems like it's in the early stages, but here's a prospective non-experimental look at uh, Sugamidex in 10 my sneeze gravis patients. Everything else I could find were just single case studies. Uh, but here, they use Sugamidex in Osmerin class 2B to 3, so moderately severe disease for myasthenic gravis. And then after an ED95 dose of rock and subsequent doses to maintain um, relaxation throughout the procedure, reversal uh, using two milligrams per kilogram, which is not the max dose of Sugamidex, was able to reverse on average less than two minutes uh, patients um, with myasthenic, uh, with myasthenic gravis. So this may be an ideal drug in the future in the States one day for these patients um, with this disorder. You know, there are many other implications to myasthenic gravis. You know, these patients, some resources advocate the use of glycopyrrolate because they are on um, anticholinesterase drugs and they're likely to have higher salivation um, if they're well controlled. Um, preoperative medications such as uh, Versed and using opioids prior to induction may not be the wisest choice because they're not going to be able to take deep breaths. Um, it may even become hypopnic on you prior to induction. Um, you may not need muscle relaxation. If we're not talking about a thymectomy and we're talking about another simple procedure, um, maybe the use of a LTA or remifentanil for induction. Um, um, uh, muscle relaxation is not needed for intubation. Um, nerve block, um, multimodal is all advocated. Um, and you want to make sure that these patients meet extubation criteria. So you want to be extra vigilant. All the same uh, extubation criteria uh, apply. Um, Barish notes that uh, it recommends that the patient can uh, take an inspiratory breath of up to negative 30 centimeters of water um, prior to extubation. Um, Neuraxial approaches in the upper extremities may be controversial because if you ablate their phrenic nerve, um, are they going to be able to compensate? Uh, these are things that you want to think about for these type of patients.